Okay, so I'll be talking about some organic pesticide trials that we did in the southeast, and one of the important things we have to talk about is that every now and then we, we get into this vicious cycle where farmers try to follow recommendations that have nothing to do with the location where they are found. So you use the recommendations, they don't work, and then you think these things don't work, and then you move away. So what we tried to do was to do uh, an area-specific kind of research so the results are relevant to farmers in the southeast. And uh, before I get in trouble, let me just acknowledge all those who were involved in the project, research project in North Carolina State, Mississippi, and uh, a whole host of people who have collaborated with us on the project. And, uh, the work that I'm going to report has a lot of uh, the research work that uh, Ms. Sonu Perella a graduate student did for her thesis. Okay, so environmental conditions here, and I'm, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the uh, early parts of the track, but I want to get to the results where, uh, which is most important. So the environmental conditions that we have here are bring for high temperatures. They make for high pest numbers, uh, and then that makes organic uh, uh, agriculture or food production very difficult. So like I said, we need a research-based area-specific kind of information so we can give our farmers uh, uh, relevant information. And we, we work on four major crops, we work on sweet potatoes, we work on tomatoes, uh, squash, uh, and then southern peas. And uh, the importance of squash in 2000, uh, since it was ranked the system, the fifth uh, were ranked the fifth producer in the world. So it's quite an important crop. We have some major pests like the squash bag, which is a major problem. Uh, it's almost like when you grow squash anywhere, even when it is a sealed environment, it's almost like you find uh, the squash the squash bag. But we have colleagues in North Carolina for whatever reason the location where they are, they grow two years consecutively and they, they don't record squash. Uh, so it's a major problem. We have other pests like thrips that cause problems if hoppers aphids. And basically one of the things most conventional growers, there's some kind of research that says so we've evaluated this, this is how it performs here, but for our uh, organic growers in the southeast, sometimes we have not evaluated the pesticides in our area where we can talk about this is what it does and this is how it behaves because sometimes environmental conditions can totally alter how a pesticide performs at a specific location. So we wanted to look at the population dynamics of pests on these various crops that I mentioned throughout the year. We wanted to find out whether there are some varieties that the pests prefer uh, to others because if a pest prefer doesn't prefer variety, one of the easiest ways is to grow that variety so we don't have to be worrying about uh, pesticides and stuff like that. And we also wanted to actually assess the performance of the organic products, uh, pesticides we're using, and then how cost effective uh, are these. Even as a pest management professional, sometimes even we get sidetracked. We get to a point where we start thinking killing the insect or the pest becomes like the goal. It's not the goal. Crop protection is the goal. And sometimes we get so caught up in killing the insect that we forget them. So every now and then we have to remind ourselves. So you are killing insects, but does it make economic sense? What amount of crop loss are you preventing? So I will not spend a lot of time on the materials and methods as well because part of this work was done in Tuskegee, North Carolina, Mississippi. Uh, this is how we set up our field, uh, like a completely randomized uh, design. Uh, like I said, I don't want to. This is the field layout. I can discuss the field layout in detail. These are the various varieties that we use for squash and southern peas. I will not go into the commercial names of the pesticides. I'm not being paid to promote any pesticide. I'll go with the uh, active ingredients uh, and how much they cost. Uh, we set up sticky casts in the middle of the rows. We did visual sampling to see what uh, pest populations we were uh, seeing. And uh, then we got, now we get to our results where we talk about thrips. Uh, I'll spend less time. We observed something very interesting. Uh, 
you may notice that this is the population of trips within this in 2018-2019. You may notice that in the control experiment we had 10 cell. That, that's day by day. Then we have azadiraptin and parethrin, and they are actually recording higher numbers than uh, the control. So you are actually spraying a bio pesticide and the numbers are going up. Uh, our friends in toxicology, they have what we call homolygosis, where when you spray sublethal doses of a pesticide, it can actually cause some particular insects to start multiplying. Something is trying to kill them, they want to persist. Uh, it's a response in one part. So there are all kinds of things that we are observing that we have to do the research so that our farmers know that there are certain things that can happen uh, when you spray some of these products. Okay. So we observed it in 2018, we observed it in 2019, we made uh, some observations like that with aphids as well in, uh, in both years. So I'm just, I'm, we have a lot of results on different pests that we we dealt with. See, with these, 18 June and 15, when we spray with spinosad, these are the numbers we are recording. So you can you see all kinds of uh, things with the various pests. And then this one talks about the um, performance of the biopesticide in summer squash against the squash bar. And based on date, you will see it spread out. There may be differences in the performance. Here you will see that the control had the highest population. You will see that pyrethrin had uh, low populations and spreads out uh, with time. Beginning, you don't really see a separation. Uh, another thing we observed is that in year one, we didn't use plastic. Okay, so we spray the product, it's easy to get to the squash but it's relatively easier. Year two, we decided we wanted to use plastic to control the weeds and then it became a problem because the squash bars go hide under the plastic and then you are spraying. And, and most of these products don't have a long residual activity, so it's not like they are going to remain active to deal with the squash bars that are when not directly contracted uh, when we spray them. We also have, uh, uh, this one talks about the mean number of pirate bars. Now, this is one place you don't want to see significant differences, you want to, these are all beneficial insects, so you want to be sure that your products are not reducing pest numbers. For some of the crops that we dealt with, we noticed that, but for other uh, crops we didn't. Now if you look at 18th June on the 10th, this is the uh, number that we have, but as a directive, made it go up. Well, we, in this particular case, it's a good thing. If the, if the pest, the pest is that is making the uh, uh, natural enemies multiply faster, that is actually great. We just don't want that happening with the pest. Uh, I'll skip through some of these. Then we have trips. Uh, anybody who is interested, we can discuss what we found with the number of these products. Like I said today, I want to talk about squash bag. Rush through it and get to a little bit of uh, information on uh, southern peas as well. So we saw distribution significant. We were also trying to find out well, are some varieties uh, 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 they attract more of certain species than others? Now, if you look here, let's say 11th of July, you see uh, spineless beauty had the highest mean number of aphids in the trap. Uh, and the initial phases, the distribution was not that clear. So we are looking at it. If there are some varieties that attract certain pests more than others, then maybe there will be, uh, if they attract less, then there will be uh, pests, uh, varieties that we want to use. If not, uh, then they may not be the ones we want to use. For this, we notice the, the separation on the 20th of June, 27th of June, best getting to the end of the research activity, we were not seeing a lot of separation. Uh, not much different. This is for squash, but with the various varieties, we saw some separation at different times. Initially, there was really no, uh, nothing like post -progress. We also wanted to find out what the relationship for each of the varieties, we wanted to find out what the relationship was between, uh, uh, this is predator-prey relationships. 
some of them you see beautiful cases like the textbook says, okay, when the population of the pest, maybe they think say pirate bag, and the tricks, well, that's the pest was going up, what was happening with pirate bags. We saw a number of very strong relationships, but in certain environments and in certain varieties, there were slight differences in what we saw. And every now and then we see what we call a functional, we we'll see what we call a functional response where you don't actually see the population of uh, beneficial organisms going up or down, but the existing population will be doing a better job controlling the pest. But we, for, for, for the most part, you see uh, that kind of uh, classical relationship when the population of food is going up, the population of the natural enemies goes up with it. Now, if the population of natural enemies goes up beyond a certain point, the feeding pressure on the pest gets so high that it begins to dip. So you keep seeing that curve going back and forth. But uh, it varies with the kind of variety we have and what we are dealing with. Uh, so uh, that's mainly for summer squash. I may not be able to get to the southern peas. Uh, we have five minutes more. Uh, if there are questions, I'll do. But let, let me quickly talk about cost analysis. And we spray for the same number of times uh, for all the pesticides we were using. So we just mainly focus on cost to see cost effectiveness. And when we look at it, periphery, we seem to be spending less money uh, spraying uh, periphery than we did with uh, the Spinosaur product and the other the Rapkin, uh product. Uh, when it comes here, so same, same thing, but let's talk about uh, what our conclusions are. We noticed that some squash cultivar did not exert any significant effects on the population of pests of beneficial insects in 2018, but in 2019 that situation changed. Uh, we also noticed that the Barbestas performed similarly against squash bars in 2018, but in 2019, Paretrin actually performed better. Uh, we are looking at what should we do? Should we revise the action thresholds that we're using? I mean, the population of pests at which we start spraying, uh, we have to change that. We have to constantly work on this thing to see what uh, action thresholds work for the various uh, products. We also concluded that pyrethrin was the most cost-effective about pesticide. And sometimes we are not noticing a, a difference in yield, but there are farmers, even when you tell them don't spray, once they see the pest, they are going to spray. So our thing is, if you are going to spray, at least use the less uh, costly version so you don't waste too much money. There's a lot we can talk about. I want to entertain questions, so I've not talked about solving peas here, but uh, I'll end at this point. So, given what you have, do you think if you have mutated the insecticide, do you think you have seen some different, you know, like the yeah. First of all, we are moving the location each time we, we do the, the, the product. Yes, that's one thing. For the final year, we are going to do proper ID. We are going, the products that we find are working. We are going to incorporate them into pro, uh, programs like, okay, natural enemies, uh, the normal thing you do, rotate them. You use this for two times, then you rotate to something else and then get back to it. We couldn't have done it here because we wanted to check to find out which one was performing better. But if we find two good ones that do well, and we know the cost elements to it, when we have three products and one is most expensive, less expensive, and least expensive, for somebody we are looking at the cost element. So you go least expensive, maybe three times, and then do the uh, midway expensive, maybe two times. So we are not only looking at killing the pest, but we are looking at the cost elements too. So we will incorporate it into the IPM program in the final year, but we, we have to split, split them up to, to get the information. I think in addition to that, we also you know, manage resistance. Yes. Yeah, yeah, so that's why we would have to rotate it anyway. But now we wanted to test which one was working well and which one was at least cost effective, so we had to split them up at this point. I have a question about the pest-predator relationships. 
So I saw that you showed the cycles of relationships with your sampling time over the season, and I wondered if you looked at their relationships after spray events, because you mentioned that the spray could affect the predators as well. And so if you saw an increase in pests, did you also ever see a decrease of enemies after spray? Okay. So because I was rushing through it, I left out the minor detail. For the pest predator relationship, we're only doing it for control plots where we were not spraying. Okay. We wanted to be sure pesticide application was not affecting what we were seeing. So the, uh, those graphs were not from treated plots. So you did not, where you were spraying, you did not also monitor? We monitored it. At, I didn't present that here. Okay. We have that information, but the, all those graphs, uh, charts you saw, were from control plots. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you.